So, like I said, we're going to get stuck straight in uh, looking at the first theme, which is called the Apocalyptic War. Uh, the, the the kind of subheading for this as well is Christus Victor, which is the Latin for Christ, the, the victorious Christ, essentially. Um, and there's a few quotes there that you can read through. I'll just read this last one uh, by Miroslav Wolf, who's a fantastic theologian. Uh, he says this, the world to come, which is an important theme in, in the apocalyptic war, is ruled by the one who on the cross took violence upon himself in order to conquer and embrace the enemy. The Lamb's rule in the book of Revelation he's talking about is legitimized not by the sword, but by its wounds. The goal of its rule is not to subject, but to make people reign forever and ever. With the Lamb at the center of the throne, the distance between the throne and the subjects has collapsed in the embrace of the triune God. So we've come to our um, penultimate motif out of all the ones that we've looked at. Like I said, I, I've skipped off two, so we're not going to be looking at substitution, which is probably the one that we're all most familiar with, because it's the most, um, uh, if, for those of us, uh, who I think it's the majority of us from an evangelical background, that's the probably the one that we're most familiar with. Uh, and also recapitulation, uh, which which we will touch upon uh, uh, to to a degree with looking at the apocalyptic war as well. So. We won't, it won't be completely absent. Um, and I think that the apocalyptic war uh, is really probably the most important motif. Um, it's because it's the key to unlocking the New Testament. So if, if we haven't really grasped the apocalyptic war uh, or apocalypticism uh, is another way of talking about that, then we're operating, I think, with something of a slightly impoverished understanding of, of our holy scriptures, the Christian scriptures, the New Testament. And Fleming um, prefaces this chapter in her book with a caution. Uh, she writes, uh, she writes this. If the Christian community is being its true self, it will be deeply suspicious of battle imagery. I think that for, the, for the best part of two millennia, um, Christians have all too often gone to war in the name of God. A God made in their own image. And we should rightly be ashamed of this this fact, I think. Uh, we have to own up to that the, the, the darker side of the church's history. And Fleming uh, continues to say, Christian battle imagery is paradoxical. It, the, the military terms, swords, shields, chariots, armies, are used in a metaphorical sense to evoke a warfare that takes place in the unseen realm. She says, battles waged not with worldly weapons, but with the spiritual armor of God. And in part, the danger with um, military imagery is that it lends itself very nicely to the phenomena of Christian nationalism. And that isn't something that can be relegated to the past with things like the Crusades um, and, and the centuries of bloody war between Christians and Muslims. Uh, this is an all too real and all too recent phenomena. So national socialism in, in Germany uh, was in many ways a Christian nationalist movement, even though Hitler himself, uh, a self-professed atheist, he, he had no qualms about deploying Christian battle imagery for his purposes. And uh, Martin Luther, the German reformer, um, for all the good that he did and all the, the wonderful things that he wrote and did, towards the end of his life, he took a very bitter turn towards um, anti-Semitism. Uh, and Hitler didn't need to at all to twist his words for his own purposes. He could just use them as they were written. Uh, and and he yeah he he really uh, went to town on the, on the propaganda of, of Christian uh, nationalist imagery. Just last year, uh, Patriarch Kirill, who is the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, said that Putin's nuclear arsenal was the result of divine providence. Uh, we have here an image of a Russian Orthodox priest blessing a nuclear warhead. Um, and it was Christian nationalists as well that, that stormed the US Capitol on the 6th of January, just three years ago, um, praying for God's blessing on their violent deed as well as they, as they went in and people people died on that day. So, uh, and unfortunately, I think it's on the rise even in the UK uh, in, in probably slightly more implicit and subtle ways. But this caution standing still, uh, we it, it doesn't exclude us from using um, military lingo altogether. Uh, it's very helpful uh, in some ways to use military lingo. We just need to qualify that imagery with the kinds of weapons of warfare that Christ chooses. 
you could say uh, the, the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Prayer is another weapon of God. Uh, his soldiers are those uh, not who are uh, powerful and mighty, but those who are weak, uh, the poor, the vulnerable, the foolish, uh, those without power, the old, the young, um, the marginalized. God doesn't use uh, violent tactics. He uses uh, nonviolent resistance, radical subversion and uh, a kind of revolutionary subordination as well. And I think this um, this story from Fleming sums it up well about Rosa Parks. So she writes, when Rosa Parks was arrested in Montgomery, Alabama, for refusing to give up her seat to a white person, the civil rights pioneers Clifford and Virginia Durr, both born to privilege in white Alabama society, came to jail to bail her out. When Virginia Durr died in February 1999, Rosa Parks wrote a letter addressed to her posthumously and sent it to the large surviving Durr family. It included these words, I will miss you, old soldier. And she makes a point of saying this is an aged, physically frail old lady speaking. Mrs. Parks did not need any politically correct person to tell her that military imagery was not appropriate. Mrs. Parks and Mrs. Durr knew what it was like to be in battle. Um, I read a fantastic uh, biography of the latest biography of Martin Luther King last year. Um, and again, he he uh, someone who um, promoted nonviolent resistance above all else, used a lot of military language at the same time. So the other thing I think to be wary of um, another caution, I suppose, uh, is thinking of apocalyptic in terms of the popular imagination. So most of the English speaking world uh, will be familiar with this mystifying word apocalypse and apocalyptic, and it will conjure up images of the end of the world and a kind of dystopian future. And there have been all kinds of movies, um, kind of end times movies made about that and, and these dystopian worlds where there's been a nuclear holocaust and all, all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a need for the church to recover the proper sense of this word because it's really Im important and it's really crucial to uh, Christian thought and theology. So apocalypse, excuse me, whoa, <clears throat> apocalypse simply means revelation or a disclosure or an unveiling of something. Uh, something is being revealed. Hence why the book of Revelation uh, which stands directly in line with other apocalyptic texts like the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, could more rightly be called the Apocalypse to John. Not the Apocalypse of John, because it's not John being revealed, but Jesus. So apocalyptic in the Bible is a literary genre which relates to the liberating intervention of the God who reveals himself. And it's already been at work in all the other motifs we've looked at as well. So that's why I think it's the kind of key to that holds all of these different motifs together. So when we looked at the Passover and the Exodus, its presence was quite um, conspicuous. God revealed himself to Moses. He gave his name to Moses, no less. Uh, Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton, I am what I am, uh, and liberated the people of God from slavery in Egypt. This liberating uh, action of God is, is what it is, is at the heart of apocalyptic theology and apocalyptic uh, biblical uh, writings. Uh, the cross is the Passover and Exodus par excellence as well uh, in this case for its kind of universal uh, efficacy, the, the, the universal way in which God liberates people from bondage. Um, the law coats of the blood sacrifice showed uh, the inadequacy of human repentance as a solution to the cosmically distorting problem of sin and the need for uh, an outside intervention, for God's intervention. And this also laid the groundwork as well for a lot of um, later exilic texts when, when the, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, when the people of God, having been liberated by God from the oppressive regime of Pharaoh in Egypt, once again found themselves to be strangers, exiles, um, foreigners in foreign lands uh, under multiple successive uh, regimes, different empires as well. Um, so the exile, that, that season in the life of, of God's people where they had been liberated from Egypt, they'd moved into the promised land, 
then the establishment of the, the monarchy and then the, the monarchy splits and you have two kingdoms and the northern kingdom falls to the Babylonians and then eventually the southern kingdom falls as well and the people are, 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 are dispersed throughout this empire. Um, they're, they're made slaves throughout this empire. This, this uh, uh, exilic period prompted something of a kind of theological crisis as well uh, in, the people of, in the people of God and their, their theological outlook. And they needed to look for a solution to the massive problem of sin um, outside of themselves and outside of the, the law codes. So texts begin to emerge uh, in the Old Testament that foretell of God's cosmic victory. This is more than just this small group of people. This is a cosmic victory. It's beyond uh, just the people of Israel to include the whole cosmos. This cosmic victory over the powers, uh, the principalities. Uh, and the inauguration of a new age. Again, this is a really um, key bit to apocalyptic literature, this idea of two ages or two eons. Uh, it's a very important concept. Uh, and the coming age is the one when God will, es will establish an everlasting kingdom on earth. So we have texts like uh, Zechariah uh, 14 verses 9 and 11, where uh, he says, the Lord will become king over all the earth on that day, the Lord will be one and his name will be one. Sometimes it's, uh, it's read as uh, the Lord will be all in all. Uh, and it says that in Revelation as well. And I think the pinnacle of these, these apocalyptic texts in the Old Testament that arose out of this, this crisis, this theological crisis, comes in uh, the books of Ezekiel, where we have the valley of the dry bones and God bringing something new to life out of the dry bones. And in the book of Daniel uh, as being probably the most uh, conspicuously apocalyptic text in the Old Testament. Daniel is written a lot later than the events that it purports to be. So it's actually one of the latest books of the Old Testament, but it's writing about a period much earlier. Um, and Daniel has this dream of the arrival, uh, the advent of the Son of Man, the Messiah. Um, and all of these texts and these movements, these theological movements that are occurring out of this place of crisis, they all suggest a God who acts independently of his people's response or their lack of response. God will work anyway. Um, when we looked at the ransom and re uh, redemption motif, uh, that suggested that humanity is held in bondage against its will by a captor too strong for it. Deliverance has to come from another sphere altogether, like that SWAT team that's breaking in to uh, release the hostages. And then in the great assize, the great judgment, it was suggested that human activity does not bring about the purposes of God. It simply points to the action of God already at work in the world. This is the God who just who just works, who is just doing stuff all the time, who isn't aloof and distant, but intervenes, who invades. Uh, again, it's using this military language because that's how the, the, the Bible uses it quite often, who invades this present world. Uh, this present darkness, as Paul would put it. Uh, and it also suggested in, in the greater science that God's judgment, his rectifying action, his power to put things right, God's righteousness, uh, is uh, not simply individual. Uh, it's not even corporate. Again, it's cosmic to the highest degree. The righteousness of God this was um, if you had a chance to look at the the, the little addition I added onto the, the last recording. It was all about the righteousness of God. The dikaiosine is the Greek word. Dikaiosine of God, which is God God's power to make what is wrong right, uh, to make everything sad come untrue, which is how Samwise Gamgee puts it in Lord of the Rings. Um, and it, it's a cosmic power. It works across the whole of the cosmos. Uh, so like that word. Um, which spoke creation into being out of nothing. God's righteousness is a word that he speaks, which is able to grant what it requires. It is able to bring right out of wrong. The, the kind of nothingness of sin, it brings life. Uh, and the nothingness of death, it brings life. So apocalyptic then could, could be said to be more than just a biblical genre. It's really it's a it's a transformative way of seeing and being in the world. And I think it's reasonable to assume that given the prevalence of this worldview um, 
cosmos view would probably be a better way of putting it in the late portions of the hebrew bible so the, the old testament is is really back-ended with all this apocalyptic stuff um in the late portions of the hebrew bible and it's again really really prevalent in the in the time between the testaments the intertestamental periods there's about a 500 year gap between the old testament and the new testament where apocalyptic uh, literature really comes to the fore and is really developed uh, in jewish thought and theology it's reasonable to assume that this was a view that jesus himself would have shared the incarnate god uh, when jesus was here on earth he would have had this this idea and also of course, Jesus himself uses a lot of apocalyptic language as a result. The point for our present discussion, though, is that it is the cross, which is the definitive apocalypse, the definitive revelation of God. The cross is the vital center of the gospel because it reveals to us who God is and what God is like. And how God works. This is the, the quote from Jürgen Moltmann there on the crucified God is, is getting at, at that. This is what God is like. When we look at the cross, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we're seeing exactly what God is like. And this is why one of the, um, the reformers during the Reformation of the 16th century, one of their mantras was crux probat omnia. The cross is the test of everything because on the cross we see uh, all that there is to know God fully unveiled uh, God fully showing himself to the world revealing himself to the world this is what I am like which is really important uh, and I've, I've included a quote from Brian Zand from from his book here because uh, I think it's it, again it's beautiful the way that he talks about it but he's he was reflecting at this moment about the spear going into the side of Christ and where the blood and water pours out uh, and he says to see Christ upon the cross is to see into the very depths of the heart of God, where once in our distant pagan past, we imagined there lurked monstrous intent, threatening harm. We now discover there is only tender compassion on the cross. We encounter a God who would rather die than kill his enemies. When we look through the riven side of Christ into the heart of God, we gaze upon a vast cosmos filled with galaxies of grace. <clears throat> so um thinking about apocalyptic as a biblical genre as a literary uh genre in the bible so apocalyptic has a relatively recent um pedigree in the world of biblical scholarship for anyone that's interested uh it's rediscovery really it is a rediscovery because the early church fathers you know, way back in the th um in the fourth and fifth centuries uh, the, the very earliest Christian thinkers, they all thought in apocalyptic terms and then it kind of waned, had a small uh, brief uh, recovery during the Reformation and then it waned again. And then in the 20th century, it came back to the fore, um, mainly due to a German scholar called Ernst Kaisermann, uh, who, if you watch the Advent series of webinars I did, I talked at length about Ernst Kaisermann and his apocalyptic view. Uh, and two of his students, uh, one is called Johann Christian Becker, um, and the other is called J. Lewis Martin. And these scholars were reflecting on a number of texts, primarily the letters of Paul, and they noticed the prevalence of language about these, these two ages, uh, these two eons, the present age of the dominion of sin and death and the age to come, which is the age of God's dominion, of God's kingdom. Uh, and J. Lewis Martin in particular, he discerned um, some, that's not him, that's, that's the Apostle Paul. Um, uh, he discerned some important uh, characteristics of apocalypticism in the letters of Paul. Uh, six things. The first one is uh, the new thing. So in Paul, we see that a new thing has been revealed. Uh, you might recall the words of Isaiah there. Um, see, I am doing a new thing. And that comes in a very apocalyptic part of Isaiah as well. Uh, I'm doing a new thing. A new thing is being called into being by God. Something that did not exist previously has been called into being by God through the cross, which stands as a reversal of all previous arrangements. So reversal of the blood sacrifice and the law and all those things. All those things have been undone. We are speaking of the God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. The God who calls creation into being out of nothing. He calls life out of death. 
The second thing is is the old thing. So there is a break between this this new cosmos and the old. That new thing is the, that that reversal of death on the cross is uh, in a large part prefigured, foreshadowed in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Torah. So the, 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 the fingerprints of it throughout the Hebrew Bible, and especially early on in the Hebrew Bible, the law of God, all of these things, however, have been remade on the cross. Uh, so uh, uh, Paul writes in Galatians 6, in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the world, the cosmos is the word that he uses, has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision, i.e. the law, counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So the apocalypse of God on the cross is not the inevitable outcome of what came before, but a complete reconstitution of it. Uh, the third thing is an alien invasion. So God is acting upon this world, this cosmos, from outside it. God intervenes into this one from outside of it. Uh, so as the, as the late Old Testament prophets attest, the human predicament is so tragic that there is no solution to it from within human history. Humans will not come up with the answer to their predicament. They cannot find the solution in and amongst themselves. The, the kind of myth of, of progress, uh, especially brought about by the Enlightenment, that you know human beings can just get better and better and better, uh, which I think has fallen on its face in the twenty in the twentieth and twenty first centuries, um, is just is not 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 what's in view in this in this case. Um, there has to be an outside intervention, an alien intervention, something completely other has to come in to fix the problem. And again, you see where this intersects with all the other motifs as well. So ransom and redemption, again, this this sense of being liberated, hostages being liberated by a, a kind of SWAT team or something. And the cross is God's invasion of this world from another. The cross is where God is reclaiming for himself the world that he created. And echoing again that ransom and redemption imagery, uh, Fleming calls it a dramatic rescue bid uh, into which God has flung his entire self. And they have, again, this sense of um, we talked about last time about the exertion of God, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm. God flings his entire self into this on the cross. The fourth characteristic uh, of apocalypticism is uh, the occupying forces. So there are hostile forces on the scene. There are two actors in this drama, God and humanity. There is a third, and that's the powers that unholy trinity of sin, death and the devil uh, who need to be driven from this world. The only way the, the only way we're going to resolve our situation is if those things are gotten rid of, uh, which it is only God can do. And the fifth thing is the universal scope of apocalypticism. The Apostle Paul sees the entire cosmos, the whole created order, everything, uh, not just humanity, but the whole of, of, of creation being remade, groaning, he says, as it waits for redemption uh, in Romans 8. So it's much bigger than just us. Uh, this, is a, this is a creation wide thing. So I think if, you, if you're if like me, you, you worry about uh, the state of the world, especially uh, the climate and things like that, uh, that, that gives me a lot of hope. Um, uh, uh, not in the sense that it, it d disempowers me from doing anything now because I think, oh, well, I can just sit back and relax because it's all going to be taken care of. But because of that hope, I think I'm, I'm spurred on in some way to, to act. Uh, and the final thing I've called bifocal vision. Uh, the, the apocalyptic worldview doesn't just see through the lens of this present world or, uh, or it doesn't just see through the, the lens of that future world. It sees through both lenses simultaneously. So it recognizes the present reality of evil. And we'll touch on evil a lot when we look at the descent into hell. Uh, it recognizes the present reality of evil, the ubiquity of sin and its consequences. Again, calling to mind uh, St. Anselm's words about you, you have not yet considered the weight, the gravity of sin. Um, it recognizes all those things, the violence, the cruelty, the greed, uh, disease, malice, 
death and it recognizes the, the the reality of the age to come the truth of the kingdom of god where everything is made whole and new and made known to us by the promise of the indwelling holy spirit so you can see where the church here is incredibly important as the people who have their eyes open to this and the role they have and that's the kind of ethical dimension of, of the apocalyptic worldview ethics being about how we live in the world and one one critique of um, this motif uh, is that it can seem like everything is happening without us doing anything uh, it's all happening over our heads which i think in a sense is true um, or because god is the acting subject here not us uh, that that we shouldn't kid ourselves into thinking that we can just sit back and let things unfold without lifting a finger. The Holy Spirit is not one to dwell in our hearts saying, hey, like, take it easy. The Holy Spirit is the dynamic force that flung Jesus out into the wilderness. She's the same spirit that uh, draws Jesus out of the tomb. The same spirit that brings the, the old age of death, uh, puts the old age of death to death and brings in the new. So if the Christian life is supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to act as a signpost of that future reality, of that next age, the future age, the, the age of God, the kingdom of God, the dominion of God. If the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in us now is meant to be a signpost of that, then it really matters how we live. It might be happening over our heads, but that doesn't mean we don't do anything. Uh, it matters how we live because we are acting as signposts of that future reality. Um, Again, to, to tag on to the, the, the end of last week's, talked a lot about um, reconciliation there and to Paul's command uh, to us to be reconciled because you've been reconciled to, be, to God, be reconciled to one another because that's the sign of the kingdom. That's the sign of God's inbreaking, uh, liberating move. Um, and also, uh, not just reconciliation with each other but resistance as well so resisting patterns of evil uh systemic evil resisting individual evil uh resisting the powers the principalities that is a christian imperative and uh, fleming writes uh this she says paul is concerned to show you that the christian life does not go on as if the world had remained unchanged the church is not a redeemed float boat floating in an unredeemed sea. It's not as if the only thing that has changed is that our sins are forgiven and we, person by person, come to believe in Jesus. Rather, there has been a transfer of eons, an exchange of one cosmos for another. The powers and principalities may not know it, but their foundations have been undermined and cannot last. The creation itself has been and is being invaded by the new world, the age to come. And I think this is why um, Paul asks in, in, in Romans, uh, there's several occasions where he asked, he asked the question, are we to go on sinning uh, then so that, break, so that grace can abound? Because this is all happening over our heads. And, you know, if it's all if it's all dealt with and done with, should we just keep on in sin? And he says, absolutely not. Grace wants a response. God's grace wants a response. God's righteousness, his, his power to make right what is wrong, wants a response. It doesn't require one, but it wants one. Um, the apocalyptic worldview is a, is a kind of call to arms then, because God is leading the charge and driving the enemy off the cliff back into the abyss of nothingness from whence he came. And he wants us to be with him. So apocalypticism beckons us to become what we already are. We've been reconciled. The, the problem has been dealt with. So now live into it. Don't just sit sit around and expect that God is going to do all the work. God is going to do all the work, but he wants you to join in with him. And I think then apocalypticism brings a kind of much needed correction to the ways, the many ways often in which the gospel is framed with us as the acting subjects, that it all hinges on us and our decision and our choice and our faith and our belief, which I think is ever the tendency for those who are bound up in the power of sin which um 
St Augustine and, and Martin Luther called this uh, incubatus in se. Sin curves us in upon ourselves. It makes us the central characters in the story. But apocalypticism corrects that and says, no, we're not, the, we're not the acting subjects here. God is the acting subject. He is the central character in the story. Uh, and, and J. Lewis Martin put it like this. He said, the gospel is not about human movement into blessedness, but about God's liberating invasion of the cosmos. So it's not about what we're doing, but about God's liberating invasion. The gospel is not just about personal piety. Living a Christian life isn't about personal piety, but about wholesale regime change. Uh, which I think is quite exciting in a way. And it, th this 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 worldview maintains that God is the acting subject, uh, like I said. And that's that's why it's it's called the Christus Victor motif. It's not that that we, by our faith and our belief and stuff like that, have won this this excellent victory. It's Jesus who has won the victory over death, over the powers, over the principality. It's him that's inaugurated this new age, this new kingdom. The gospel then is, is much more about, uh, much less about individual salvation. It is about that. But it's also about the universal and cosmic salvation, that it's about the defeat of powers far beyond our power to destroy. And it's the arrival of something altogether new and truly, truly awesome. And like I said, this motif doesn't drown out the others. It makes sense of them, I think. It makes sense of all the other the other motifs because it's the kind of overarching drama in which all the other motifs unfold. They're all unfolding in this in this apocalyptic conflict uh, and this this victory of Jesus that's been won. And so let's look uh, a little bit more closely at uh, how this works in the book of Romans. Because Romans is is one of, if not the, probably the most influential text, uh, arguably, in the Christian scriptures. It has uh, given shape to Christian theology. Obviously, the Gospels are, are massively uh, influential, but Romans written probably before the Gospels. Um, has given shape to what Christians believe for a very long time. It's the closest thing we have to a kind of biblical systematic theology saying this is what God is like. This is what salvation means. This is what God's righteousness is. This is what faith is. Um, and it's shaped biblical interpretation as well. So we, we interpret the Bible through Romans. Uh, we interpret the Old Testament through Romans. That's what Paul is doing for quite a lot of it as well. And as a result, it is also one of the most disputed and hotly contested letters in the New Testament. So there's a lot of um, a lot of synergy and agreement about what 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 is important in Romans, but also a lot of disagreement. People are uh, grappling with this text because they realise the importance of it. So Paul begins this letter, which takes us back to our first session when we looked at this verse, uh, with this this resounding proclamation of the gospel in Romans chapter one. He says, "I am not ashamed of the gospel." Uh, why would he be ashamed? Because the gospel is about the shameful crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness, uh, the dikaiosine is the Greek word, the righteousness of God, God's power to make right what is wrong, is revealed, uh, the word there is apocalypsed, uh, apocalypsis, uh, the righteousness of God is apocalypsed through faith for faith. And the word for faith that Paul uses is pistis. Then comes this long section in the next few chapters where Paul is at pains to show how everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, so that's Jews and everyone else, basically. So everyone is enslaved to this cosmic power that we call sin. Against sin being much more than just our individual acts of, of you know, whatever it's, it's this cosmic power that works on us and Paul then kind of sets up something of a straw man talking at length about those who are under the law uh, which is really another way of talking about the action of human beings to try and make themselves righteous to try and right their own wrongs uh, he then smashes down this straw man in Romans 3 21 where he says but now apart from the law the righteousness of God so apart from the futile human attempts at self-justification, the righteousness, uh, the dikaiosine, the righteousness of God has been disclosed, again, apocalypsed, and it is attested to 
by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through the faith of Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified. That is, they are now made righteous by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. That's a clear reference to the cross, effective through faith. Uh, and you'll notice the way actually, so this is from the NRSV uh, updated edition. Um, and you'll notice the way how, which, which came out uh, three years ago, so 2021. So it's kind of cutting edge biblical uh, scholarship uh, in, in that translation. And they've translated there and in several other places, instead of saying through faith in Jesus Christ, it's through the faith of Jesus Christ, which is this kind of apocalyptic influence where they've recognized, ah, this is something here, because the Greek is actually very ambiguous. Ambiguous. Again, I, I, I covered this at the end of the last video, uh, so I don't want to repeat it too much, but the Greek is very ambiguous. It doesn't say faith of Jesus Christ or faith in Jesus Christ. It just says uh, pistis Jesu Christu. So it, it's not clear as to which we're talking about here. Is it our faith or is it Jesus's faith? And the apocalyptic influence on, on the NRSV UE, which is why I, I love this translation, uh, places Jesus as the acting subject again. It's saying, no, we're talking about the faith of Jesus here. It's his act of faith. Again, a reference to the cross. The whole event of Easter is Jesus's faithfulness uh, is, is what makes the difference, is what brings about the change, is what ushers in the new kingdom. It's not based on us. If it was, then it would be very flawed, a plan on God's part, uh, because we're flawed. So as Fleming uh, puts it, to say, as as Paul proceeds to do, that there is no distinction, uh, he says in 322, uh, between godly and ungodly, religious and irreligious. No, it's not from 322, it's from somewhere else, sorry. I can't remember where that's from. She says, to say, as Paul proceeds to do, that there is no distinction between godly and ungodly, religious and irreligious, good people and bad, is to snatch away the very foundations of religious certainty. What she's getting at is this idea that that we're the ones in, in control here, that we know what's going on because we're Christians, because we have had our eyes opened in some way to the reality of God's inbreaking kingdom. That we're the ones who can say, oh, well, we know that we're the good people and they're the bad people, or we know that we're the sheep and they're the goats. And, and I think that that's really interesting. And I think it's interesting because doubt is often uh, contrasted against faith as though it's the opposite of faith. Uh, and what Fleming is saying, is it's not the opposite of faith. Certainty is the opposite of faith. And that certainty is trumped by the righteousness of God spoken into us, reckoned to us uh, by his living word, Jesus Christ. And then we enter uh, Romans five and six, uh, which are really uh, incredibly important chapters, quite complex argument that Paul puts forward, but they're again, very, very important and again, very, very influential. So as we enter Romans five, we see that Paul begins to draw a number of striking parallels between Adam and Christ. And this is um, this is what the recapitulation motif that we haven't had a chance to look at is, is getting at. Uh, and we see here the kind of apocalyptic characteristic of the two ages or the two eons or the two dominions uh, uh, being played out here with Paul talking about Adam of the old age and Christ of the new age. Uh, and each of these dominions or these ages has its own Lord as well. Uh, and he labours the point, to, I think, to great effect in chapter five, uh, verse 12 onwards. He says, but the free gift i.e. the grace of Christ, is not like the trespass, i.e. the sin of Adam in the Garden of Eden. If because of the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one, much more surely, how much more, Paul says, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. And that's really a, a wonderfully apocalyptic uh, uh, take on what the gospel is, is about. Uh, and this polarity between Adam and Christ 
and the difference between the two. But Christ's grace being that much more, how much more, Paul is saying, much more surely is the grace of Christ superior to the sin of Adam. Uh, and that's why it's probably one of my, my favourite passages. So here Adam represents the old age under the dominion or, or the lordship of sin, uh, uh, which leads to death. Christ represents the new age, the dominion of grace, which leads to uh, righteousness and eternal life. So Paul is saying that death in some ways uh, is indeed a great power, a great and terrible power is death. But decaiosine, God's active power in writing wrong is so so much greater and Paul's kind of emphatic about this as well and as we shift into chapter six we see Paul once again uh, wrestling with the kind of ethical dimensions of all this repeatedly asking the question which is the question we asked earlier what then are we to say should we continue in sin in order that grace may increase by no means how can we who died to sin go on living in it we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion, again, very important word, over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies. And Paul is really, really hot on this. He's taking the full force of the cross, the victory that Jesus Christ has achieved on the cross. And he's saying that, saying to us, now live as though that is true, because it is true for you. Uh, Christ's victory has been won for you. So live accordingly. And the theologian Philip, Philip Ziegler writes that in Paul's gospel, Revelation, Apocalypsis, denotes God's redemptive invasion of the fallen order of things, such that reality itself is decisively remade in the event. God's advent, his arrival in Christ, utterly disrupts and displaces previous patterns of thought and actions and gives rise to new ones that better comport with the reality of a world actively reconciled to God. So we see, again, a kind of bifocal vision that you live in, in the dominion of sin, that you should live as though you are under the dominion of, of Jesus, because that's the true reality. That's the truer thing. Uh, it's more true in a sense. And Paul also talks here about um, each of these dominions having slaves. Uh, again, so this, this relates very much to us, um, saying that, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Uh, and he goes on uh, that we've been set free from sin uh, and enslaved to righteousness. Righteousness. There's something of a paradox here. Paul essentially conflates slavery with freedom and this stands in sharp contrast i think to the popular notion of freedom that we have in our culture today which is all about having the power to choose how you want to live your own life to speak your truth i think is, is a is a phrase that's commonly said these days this this is paul puts it i think is another way of becoming a law unto ourselves which is the literal meaning of the word autonomy as well we think we 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 lord autonomy is this this wonderful thing uh, autonomy literally means autonomos self law and I think this notion can be really incredibly deceptive because there are so many unseen and unconscious forces working on us all the time so that none of us is truly free in the sense of being completely autonomous. None of us really has free will. Again, that's that's something we love to uh, uh, think about in terms of freedom and our, our free will, my will to choose. We don't have that. We have bounded freedoms to a, to a point. Paul would say that we're all slaves to something. Uh, we're all bounded in by something. But freedom for Paul is being enslaved to the one true, good and righteous Lord, to be enslaved under his dominion, Jesus Christ, the one who dies for his slaves. Uh, rather than the one who we die being enslaved to, um, which we do in a sense with Jesus, but in, a, in, a, in the sense that death has been defeated in service to the crucified and risen Lord of the, of the new eon, the new age, we find perfect freedom. In bearing the burden of the cross, we find freedom. Uh, and this again speaks to the kind of the apocalyptic dimension of the gospel as an account of God liberating us from the dominion of death. We have been liberated from one tyrannical force into the obedience of faith. Which is the only natural and most joyful, I think, way to be. 
the righteousness of God, the invasive force of God, the liberating force of God is what enables us to live lives of obedience. It's what enables lives of obedience to take shape. That's what living new life in Christ means. And I think if you know the um, if you know the musical Les Mis uh, and the story of Jean Valjean, uh, that's a pretty potent example uh, of that living that new life that he's granted by the bishop who he steals the candlesticks and the bishop uh, doesn't doesn't reprimand him for it. I'm going to very quickly um, uh, breeze through another example away from Paul, which is in uh, Gethsemane. Um, so we can see the apocalyptic war kind of at work in the Gospels as well. It's not just Paul that, that is about apocalypse. It's Jesus himself, again, thoroughly apocalyptic. Um, and God initiates the define the, the, the definitive, sorry, the definitive apocalyptic confrontation in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's when he initiates that that conflict, that, that battle that he's about to win on the cross. And in Gethsemane, we find Jesus struggling in prayer as he tries to discern how his imminent death on the cross fits into the inbreaking of God's kingdom. He's here in the olive press being being squeezed uh, in the garden, facing this massive struggle with a diabolic opposition. So when he says, take this cup away from me, it isn't Jesus going up against his father or that the agony that he feels in that moment is something that his father is inflicting upon him. Jesus, just as Jesus says, not my will, but your will be done. The father and the spirit both also say not my will, but yours, because they have one and the same will. Uh, because they they all have one and the same will. They are one God. Uh, and that, again, we have to hold that in kind of cognitive tension because we're thinking together three and one and one and three. And it doesn't make sense to us. So the agony that Jesus feels um, and the word agony comes from the Greek word, uh, the, the root word agon, which means to do combat. So Jesus is doing combat. The agony that he feels, the cup he wishes would pass is due to his fear and reluctance of taking on the powers and the principalities. He feels here the great burden, the weight of sin, the gravity of sin bearing down on him, crushing him, pushing him down into the dread of Sheol and Hades and Gehenna. Uh, and this, um, yeah, there's, there's other quotes there that I think are very helpful. Um, and unlike other tales of Jewish and, and Christian martyrs who all went to their deaths with a kind of stoic serenity uh, and unflinching resolve. When we think of someone being martyred, we don't think of them in agony in, in such a way. We think of them being very stoic about the, the going to their death for a, for a profound cause. Jesus, who is fully human, is in really profound disarray. He shudders in horror. He bleeds. Uh, he sweats blood. The son of God is about to initiate the decisive battle with the powers of darkness. Um, and so Karl Barth writes that when Jesus rose from his prayer in the garden, it was not withdrawal or an acquiescing to the evil purposes he was about to be subjected to, but a great and irresistible advance. He stands knowing I am leading the battle from here. It doesn't look like he is, but he is. Christ stands on the front line alone prepared to absorb the full onslaught of sin and death and the devil. Uh, and then also another apocalyptic moment happens just a, a second later when he tells his um, disciples not to sleep. And he talks about the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Two uh, uh, opposed things to one dominion, another dominion, one age, another age, the spirit of the flesh and the spirit of the, 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 the age of flesh, and the age of the spirit. <clears throat> Um, but by way of uh, concluding this uh, uh, section and kind of segueing into the next motif, we can say that when Christ came announcing the kingdom of God, which is what the Gospels are about, Jesus's proclamation that the kingdom of God has come near in his own person. Uh, Jesus doesn't appear on neutral ground. He's appeared behind enemy lines in occupied territory. And it was in this moment uh, in Gethsemane that the invasion of one kingdom was pronounced upon another. Uh, and I put a little paraphrase there of Mirasar Wolf again. Active opposition to the kingdom of Satan, which is our next subject, is synonymous with the proclamation of the arrival of the kingdom of God in Jesus. So now we come to uh, the final, uh, the final piece of the puzzle. Uh, the descent into hell. 
uh, nice and, and light and cheery for nine o'clock on a Sunday evening. Um, whenever I put my kids to bed, we always say a little prayer, uh, just thanking Jesus, um, you know, for for everything uh, and thanking for him for <clears throat> dying for us as well. Which is a concept my three year old is is starting to get interested in. So she keeps asking me about the nails in Jesus's feet. And the other day uh, when I was putting her to bed, um, Alma, my three year old daughter, she um, she said to me, Daddy, did you know as if as if she, she was the one that heard this before I did. Did you know that Jesus dived? And I, I said, oh, you mean died? Yeah, dived. And I think when we're thinking about uh, this motif and the descent into hell, this little slip up on the part of my daughter is actually really quite accurate. Uh, tradition states that when Jesus died, he plunged the depths of hell. He was swallowed up by hell. And, and again, I think the most helpful image here uh, is is the orthodox icon, the Anastasis icon, uh, that Jesus doesn't just plunge into hell, he plunders it, he harrows it, he drags humanity, kicking and screaming here as well, he dra drags them by the wrist, um, represented by Adam and Eve, out of their bondage to sin, out of death, undoing that fateful first act of sin in Eden in the process. And this is probably... Uh, in terms of Fleming's book, it's probably the most original piece of work in the whole book. Uh, it's it's outstanding. And she, she goes into a lot of detail here that we won't be able to do tonight. So it's well worth um, a read if you can can get hold of a copy. Um, it took her two years, she says, to write this one chapter. So there's no way I'll be able to do it justice in, in 20, 25 minutes or so. Uh, so if you get a chance, go and, go and read, take up and read. Now, we could go into a lot of detail about the, all the specificities of hell, and we'll do some of that, um, what it is and how it works. Uh, and I'll, I'll gladly talk about it any other time uh, in conversation. But I think suffice it to say at the outset that as I read the Bible as a whole, I think God will not permit any permanent resistance to his purpose to survive in the, un in the universe. And the images of hell as a, as a kind of um, uh, penultimate state uh, before the last judgment, which uh, several New Testament te passages kind of attest to, it might be something like that, need to be understood metaphorically as opposed to literally. But hell, as far as it is concerned, uh, many people will testify that contrary to the uh, chart topping hit by Belinda Carlisle in 1987, hell and not heaven is in fact a place on earth. So during the uh, genocide in Rwanda in 1994, a French missionary who was on the scene said that there are no devils left in hell. They're all here in Rwanda. And to that, the Christian faith says that Jesus has descended into hell and he has emerged victorious over the devils. That's that's the Christus Victor motif again. That's the apocalyptic war. If you see how they intersect, very they dovetail together. <laughs> Um, that's what it's all about, that Jesus is victorious. So we're not just doing kind of morbid reflection on hell here. We're, we're thinking about Christ's victory over death. Uh, but the, the victory over, over death and over hell, I think, cannot be proven by looking at the world as it is now. Hell seems to be kind of rampant in both public and private spheres, either in, in, the, in wars or in the drug den or in the battlefield or in the brothel, or the kind of disease ridden hospital uh, or in the home of an abuser, uh, in our schools, uh, in the dark corners of the Internet. It's it's everywhere. And yet we still maintain that the light shines, as John says, in the darkness, even in the darkness. And the darkness has not and cannot overcome it. The light of Christ seemed to have been extinguished on the cross, but the grave could not contain him. His light cannot be extinguished. Darkness could not overcome it. Um, and Fleming admits at the outset of this chapter that any, uh, uh, any particularly conspicuous biblical evidence for this motif is scant at best. There's not much of it. This, this owes itself much more to a tradition than it does the Bible in a sense, um, in, in one sense, but in, in another sense is also deeply biblical. Uh, it only really appears in two places in the Christian scriptures uh, in our New Testament. 
The most conspicuous passage is this one from uh, 1 Peter 3, which I'll read uh, in full. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He reflects Paul there talking about uh, Christ dying for the ungodly. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey. When God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight lives, were saved through water. And Peter then makes a very interesting move here where he, he attaches this to the, the sacrament of baptism. And baptism, which this prefigured now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities and powers made subject to him. Um, and so baptism, there acting as a descent into hell and an ascent out of hell as well into uh, to be with Christ. And the proclamation this this uh, what Peter talks about, this proclamation to the spirits in prison was identified very early on in the church, in the early church, as a description of the descent into hell. In chapter four of the same letter in 1 Peter, he talks about Jesus preaching the gospel even to the dead, that though judged in the flesh like men, they might live in the spirit like God. So the theological potency of this passage is such that it's so deeply embedded in the church's doctrine and tradition. And uh, the Apostles' Creed, which is a, a kind of foundational Christian text that says what Christians believe, basically, uh, an ancient statement of belief. It was written around the fifth century, uh, obviously has this passage in mind uh, when it declares that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended into hell, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. And so the creed uh, has these these two movements of Christ, like like in baptism, descent and ascent, uh, which is what Pete, Peter's saying. That's what baptism is. And there's plenty of um, apocryphal material, so uh, texts that exist outside of our biblical canon, which attest to this as well. Uh, most of which was was written a lot later than the New Testament. Hence, why it doesn't feature in our in our Bibles because it's not close enough to the the original apostles' witness. And also they get some funny ideas occasionally about Jesus. However, this tradition in the church is not without significant biblical warrant. Like I was saying, even though the, the direct references to it are, are scant and then open to interpretation as well, it still has a lot of biblical warrant. So we can we can prove that by looking at some of the, um, the key words that the Bible uses to talk about hell. So Sheol. Uh, Sheol is the Hebrew word which denoted the underworld where all the dead uh, dwell in a kind of shadowy sub-existent state. You might recall that at the time of Jesus there were um, several different sects of Jews. Uh, there were Pharisees, Zealots, Sadducees and probably probably a few others. Uh, but the Sadducees um, were those who didn't believe in a mass resurrection of the dead at the, at the culmination of the world's history when, when God's kingdom would be final and God would be all in all. For the Sadducees, this life was all there is. And for a long time before the, the, the theological crisis prompted by the exile, the people of God were effectively all Sadducees. Uh, the Hebrews, the Israelites were all essentially Sadducees. God's promised blessing to eternal life was not via resurrection from the dead, but via children and childbearing and childbirth. That was how the people of God knew back then that they had been assured of God's blessing. And all ties into God's promise to Abraham. So when you died, you would descend into Sheol, your soul would descend into Sheol, while your children lived on and you would live vicariously on through your children. And Israel um, persisted in this belief for a long, long time as well. Like again, like I said, but up until this, this the crisis, the theological crisis prompted by the exile, um, which we might frown upon that as as uh, uh, as something I don't know less than, but it's actually quite admirable I think in a way because they were simply worshiping God because He was considered worthy of worship, 
uh, without some extrinsic promise of an eternal reward. You just worship God in this life and that's what you did. And actually that relates to the crucial thing about Sheol was that it's not possible to worship God there. So actually dying was uh, for the pious Hebrew going down into Sheol and not being able to worship God. There could be nothing worse. Um, hence why the, the psalmist laments in, in Psalm 88, my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. Do you work your wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Which means destruction. And obviously on, on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday, Jesus answers a resounding yes to the psalmist's questions. But the point is that God is absent from this shadowy realm and seemingly indifferent to those who dwell in it as well. And because of God's indifference to Sheol, death came to be seen as a kind of contaminant, something utterly unclean and, and ritually despoiling. So in this light, again, it's even more remarkable when you see Jesus raising the dead and when you see him healing someone like the Gerasene demoniac, the one who lived among the tombs, who effectively lived in Sheol. The second word the Bible uses is Hades. Uh, in, class, in classical Greek uh, mythology, Hades is the name, the name of both the God of the underworld and the underworld itself. And in the New Testament, when um, or when the Old Testament was translated into Greek from Hebrew, when they came across the word Sheol, they would translate it Hades. And so in the New Testament, the concept of Sheol and Hades become conflated. Uh, the two the two ideas merge and it's imagined in Matthew 16 as a fortress barred with gates. Uh, and in Revelation, uh, Christ is, is described as having the key. Uh, he's captured the key to hell. And in that intertestamental period, that 500 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the idea of Hades was expanded further to mean a place where the ungodly were punished and annihilated or punished or annihilated. Uh, and in the book of Enoch, uh, which was was written during this time, during that 500 year period, uh, and you can read it online. You can, it's not in the Bible, obviously, but you can read it online. That's very interesting. The author speaks of Hades swallowing up uh, and destroying sinners. And interestingly, Jude, who's the penultimate author of the New Testament, wrote, wrote the book of Jude, uh, was aware of and quoted the book of Enoch. So it obviously was very um, uh, influential around the time of, of Jesus and, and the early church, the earliest church. And every mention of Hades in the Christian scriptures links him or it with death. So death also, again, becomes conceived of as this kind of uh, personified, autonomous and hostile power hostile to God which has humanity in thrall so death is not simply a, a, a kind of simply passing into a shadowy underworld but is the experience of defeat and imprisonment at the hands of God's enemy and since Cyril of Alexandria who was an early church father called hell the empire of death uh, it's it's the, the the realm of death the dominion of death again playing into this apocalyptic idea and in Mark 3, Jesus talks of, in this way, of the strong man's house. Um, uh, again, that verse from Isaiah about um, uh, God ransoming Jacob from hands too strong for him. Jesus says no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. Unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder the house. And again, drawing us back to the Anastasis icon, Jesus has hogtied the personified death before plundering Adam and Eve, i.e. humanity, from his house. Um, the final word there is Gehenna, uh, and it's probably the one most closely associated with our English word hell in, in, in meaning, in the meaning that we have for it now. And hell itself, the, the, <clears throat> the English word, is actually an agricultural term. Uh, meaning to cover over, to cover over with earth. So when you're planting potatoes, you would be helling potatoes. You'd be covering potatoes over, helling them over with earth. Uh, but Ge Gehenna is the Greek form of the Aramaic word Gehinnom, uh, a word which which designated the consuming fire of God's judgment, again reinforcing the cosmic uh, scale of of God's judgment. Uh, it's also connected to a valley of the same name outside of Jerusalem. Um, 
which was used as a place where the, the city's waste uh, was incinerated, hence the kind of fiery image there. And Jesus puts this word to pretty brutal use as well in, in, in the New Testament. He calls the Pharisees the sons of Gehenna <clears throat> and calls them a, a serpents uh, and a brood of vipers. How are you to escape being sentenced to Gehenna? Also reinforcing, reinforcing the notion there, Jesus, that no one, not even the righteous, the Pharisees who lived by every letter of the law, uh, who technically had it all together, uh, no one is exempt from the full force of God's uh, consuming fire, his rectifying judgment. And all three of these images, the shadowy underworld, the house of death and the place of tormented punishment all find their way into the New Testament canon in one way or another. And they all uh, uh, at times as well shade into each other. They merge into some kind of abysmal realm. But interestingly, um, Paul never mentions hell. I like the, the the expression on Paul's face here. It's like, hmm, help me, no. Um, instead, Paul talks of the wrath of God, which amounts uh, kind of to the same thing, almost. Uh, and this is notable, especially in the first of his letters to the Thessalonian church, which scholars um, generally agree is the earliest New Testament text, the first one to be written that we, that we have. Um, and Paul uses God's wrath as a way of focusing on the righteousness the dikaiosine of God, God's power to make right what is wrong, uh, as a power capable of overcoming sin and delivering people from condemnation. So wrath and righteousness are here connected. So it's much less about a specific place in Paul where God is absent and more about the kind of metaphorical fire of God's judgment, his rectifying judgment. And Paul intends this in a very real way as well. He, he, he means to say that the wrath of God hurts like fire and he uses the word wrath here without all the kind of hellfire and brimstone imagery though that the the medieval commentators love so much all those depictions of hell that we have and red devils with pitchforks and things which is not in the bible um and paul very strongly suggests as well i think really interestingly at, at times he explicitly suggests this and at other times implicitly that god's uh redemptive activity is at work even among unbelievers even from beyond the grave and it becomes more explicit i think uh, the more paul is reflecting on jesus that becomes that comes to the fore that notion that that god is at work redeeming people even from beyond the grave and we talked in the first session um, about the the godlessness of the cross and in the last session, we talked about the cry of dereliction from the cross in Matthew and Mark. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So if Sheol, uh, Hades, Gehenna is the place where God is not, the godless place, then the godlessness of the cross also extends into hell. And, and hell, the godlessness of hell extends into the cross as well. So they're, 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 they're merging on the cross in the death of Jesus. God enters the place where God is absent. And this is unprecedented. Again, it's a paradox. It causes us some kind of cognitive uh, dissonance. We can't grapple with this. It's totally baffling to us because we can say that God is separated from God while still remaining God and goes to the one place where God is absent from God as God. It's, um, it's, 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 it's a mental minefield, that one. Um, but the best named Catholic theologian, I think he's got the best name ever, Hans Urs von Balthasar, I'd love to have a name like that, uh, says that this is the moment uh, uh, when Christ descends into hell. This is the moment when Christ is in complete solidarity with us. His humanity is most fully realized when he is abandoned and drowned in a pit so black that no light of hope can reach it. And Fleming writes that in the symbolic space between cross and resurrection, Christ was utterly cut off from his powers, from his father, from any hope of redemption or victory. And that precisely in this kenosis, uh, which is the word that Paul uses to talk of uh, Christ's self-emptying in Philippians. In this emptying, in this kenosis, his solidarity with us and with our lot was complete. He suffered, therefore, what the book of Revelation calls the second death as our substitute. Again, the, the theme of substitution, which we haven't touched on, shows up here and in several other places. And we see uh, here 
this tension again in the different metaphors and images we have to use when we're talking about the death of Jesus. These contrasting images, because this is hardly the picture of Jesus. When we imagine Jesus descending into hell or, or you know, being absolutely abandoned by God, it's hardly the image of Jesus breaking down the door of the strong man's house and plundering his goods. It's hardly the image of the, the Anastasis icon. We have to hold both of these images together in our mind. Both things are true. One is true in the sense of Christ's power over death, his liberating invasion uh, of, of this cosmos. And the other is true in the sense of Christ's sense of abandonment and God's solidarity with his creatures who have no hope of saving themselves or making themselves right. And I mentioned at the outset that there are there are two conspicuous places in the New Testament which speak of the harrowing of hell. So the first is from those verses in in one Peter and the second comes from Ephesians. It isn't actually that conspicuous, but it's, it's more of a kind of possible allusion to uh, the descent into hell. Where Paul says, therefore, it is said when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. So Paul and Peter are kind of talking the same language here. The scope of Christ's descent, again, is cosmic. And you get, again, the sense of God's mighty exertion uh, in Christ's descent and ascent. And it could be that Paul here is talking about the incarnation in terms of descent, that his becoming human is the descent. But I think given the, the whole sweep of biblical references to, to Sheol and Hades and Gehenna, it's just as possible that Paul is talking about that in the sense that the incarnate Jesus, the incarnate God, Jesus, is experiencing the same kind of hell or hell on earth that we do, uh, even if that isn't strictly the category that, that Paul is using. Jesus sank to the lowest possible depths of human existence, sinking even as far as the godlessness of Sheol, the place where God is not. And so due to the, the horror of hell, uh, the hell that Christ entered on the cross and the hell that we experience on earth, we need to somehow account for the existence of evil, which I think in our day and age is, is almost impossible to deny. And Fleming writes, there has never been a satisfactory account of the origin of evil, and there will be none on this side of the consummation of the kingdom of God. Evil is a vast excrescence, a monstrous contradiction that cannot be explained, but can only be denounced and resisted where it appears. The Bible itself makes no attempt at explaining the origin of evil. We have parables, we have metaphors and figures of speech, but these are all just hints. And there are two figures uh, that we might look to when we're thinking about the origin of evil. The first is the serpent. Uh, we're not told of how the serpent got into the garden, nor is it safe to assume that evil, I think, simply arose out of creation, uh, that it arises out of the risk that God takes in giving his creatures a degree of freedom uh, to make choices for themselves, because that would make God the author of evil also. And that's a view that we would most certainly want to reject, that no part of God is evil. And Genesis is this mishmash of different influences as well, uh, of the surrounding cultures and, and Israel reflecting on its, on its God, Yahweh. Uh, uh, Genesis reads very much like the Enuma Elish, which is the Babylonian creation myth. They're very similar. Um, it looks like Genesis is because the Enuma Elish is much older. Genesis is taking ideas from that and rewriting it, uh, appropriating it for itself to, to sing a different note about God rather than the one of the Babylonians, which is all about violence. God the Babylonians, the Babylonian god Marduk created out of violence, but Yahweh uh, creates out of love. And the snake uh, is 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 prevalent, was very prevalent in the Canaanite um, uh, mythologies of the surrounding cultures uh, of Israel as well, uh, around the time that Genesis would have been written. And the snake represented all that was sinister and uncanny. So they're appropriating this image of the serpent and using it for their own purposes to talk about evil in some way. Um, and this account of the fall in Genesis uh, with the snake and with Adam and Eve uh, is, is not giving us a comprehensive account of the origin of evil. It's simply a story. It's not a historical account of evil. It's simply a story to illustrate a point about God. Its purpose is theological, not historical. 
And it should be noted that the serpent doesn't actually have really have any agency either. Uh, the serpent is simply, we're told, is just a shrewd and crafty creature. Um, and its insinuations to Adam and Eve suggest something of a, of a nihilistic presence, uh, meaninglessness in creation. But the, the authors of Genesis make no qualms about leaving the existence of evil in the story as some kind of unsolvable riddle. The other figure is Lucifer. Um, we have the, the two similar quotes, one Jesus from Luke and one from Isaiah. And in Tolkien's uh, epic fantasy, The Lord of the Rings, Elrond the Wise Elf says that nothing is evil in the beginning. Even Sauron, who's the Dark Lord, the kind of satanic figure, was not so. So in Tolkien's mythology, even the orcs and the goblins, who are the, the kind of evil creatures, came to be out of corruption and distortion of something originally good. It's the, 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 the elves themselves. And this parallels the, the Christian tradition of the devil as a fallen angel. So as early as the, the, the late second and early third centuries, Christians were conflating uh, Lucifer, whose name means light bearer, ironically, with, uh, with Satan, the adversary, the accuser from the book of Job. And this is something of an antidote to the, to the serpent imagery, because it allows us to affirm, as the opening chapter of Genesis does, that creation was wholly good in the beginning. Uh, you might want to refer to a doctrine of original goodness vis-a-vis -vis a, a doctrine of original sin. And in this view, the devil was an originally good part of God's creation. The devil can never be entirely independent from or co-equal to God. Satan's power is not equivalent to God's because Satan is just another creature and not the creator. And um, before he converted to Christianity, uh, having lived a very hedonistic lifestyle, the, the fifth century North African bishop, uh, St. Augustine of Hippo, uh, before he converted to Christianity, he was, he was a Manichaeist. Manichaean, Manichaeism uh, was an ancient Iranian religion uh, which operated with what's known as a dualistic cosmology. The idea in the dualistic cosmology that there are two fundamental forces in the world, both equal and opposed to each other. So you might call them good and evil. You might, it's a bit like yin and yang in Chinese philosophy. But after he converted to Christianity, Augustine had to rethink all of this Manichaeist stuff uh, because the God of Israel, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, was not an equal force to the power of evil, but far superior to it. So Augustine eventually came up with the concept of evil as non-being, which means that evil lacks existence. It has no being of its own. It is the negation or rejection of existence. Uh, this is a slightly weird thing to get our heads around. Um, the Orthodox theologian David Bentley Hart writes this, the high among Christian traditions, most venerable and most indispensable metaphysical commitments. David Bentley Hart is not the easiest person to understand. Uh, is the definition of evil as sterisis agathu in Greek or privatio boni in Latin, a privation of the good, a purely parasitic corruption of created reality. So here evil is conceived of as a kind of black hole that deprives goodness of its being. You could say that evil is the absence of good. Um, and Jeffrey Burton Russell, I think, gets this 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 idea of evil as, as non-being, as non-existence, right, uh, in his comparison to Swiss cheese. Uh, evil exists in the cosmos like holes in a Swiss cheese. The holes are there, but they are there only as non-cheese and have no existence apart from the cheese. As one cannot eat a cheese and discard the holes into a box, one cannot remove good and put evil into another category. A cheese obviously doesn't have the same shock value as evil. And we don't need to think any further than the hell on earth that was the Nazi death camps to see the way in which evil infests creation and destroys being, literally destroys beings, literally millions of beings, uh, and how these the, the death camps of, of Nazi Germany and the surrounding countries were, were the utter absence of good. So I think um, there's a lot more to say about this. Again, I've, I've um, underestimated the amount uh, of content here, but I'll end, I'll end with this uh, and this list that, that Fleming gives um, as to the origin of evil and the, the evil that we experience, the evil that Christ experienced and that Christ conquers in hell. 
So she says that God did not create and does not intend evil. This is what the Christian tradition about the descent into hell is saying. Evil is not a component of God's being. These are all good things that we want to affirm. Although evil made its appearance in the creation, it possesses no existence or being of its own, but is rather a negation or corruption of being. God is not powerless against evil, but for some reason inaccessible to us, he permits it to operate within appointed bounds. God is actively at work through human agents to challenge and resist evil so that any penultimate victory over evil in this world is a sign of God's ultimate victory. Again, there's a call there to, to Christian resistance to the powers to resist evil. And she says that evil will be conclusively and finally defeated and obliterated by God in the final judgment. Um, I'll just try and find a way to, to wrap this up quickly. Because does anyone mind if we go slightly over time? Okay, great. I don't want to leave us hanging there. Um, uh, so there's a note on theodicies. I'll skip over that quickly. Theodicy is a way of, of arguing for God's goodness. So we could ask the question, is evil a part of God's purpose then? If he permits it in some way, some way inaccessible to us. Um, I'm quite a big fan of Fyodor Dostoevsky, uh, uh, the Russian novelist. Um, and uh, one of my son's middle names is Fyodor, actually. Uh, Crime and Punishment is a classic for a reason. And everyone should go away and read it. Um, in uh, in The Brothers Kar Karamazov uh, by Dostoevsky, um, which is probably uh, Dostoevsky's most accomplished work and also the hardest to read, and it's absolutely enormous as well. And I've, I've uh, attempted it many times and, and failed at understanding it many times as well. Um, the, one of the title characters, one of the brothers, the three brothers, Ivan Karamazov, challenges his devout younger brother Alyosha on his faith. Alyosha is about to become a monk and Ivan is, is pretty much about as opposite as that you could get. And he cites the suffering of children as the most horrendous of evils. And he says, imagine if you, that you are creating, he's addressing Alyosha, that you are creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, but that it was essential and inevitable to torture only one tiny creature a baby or a small child, would you consent to be the architect on those conditions? And Alyosha rightly says, no, I would not. And so Ivan then says, it's not that I don't accept God, Alyosha. It's not that God doesn't exist because of evil. I just most respectfully return my ticket, which by which he means uh, his ticket to heaven. He's not going to take it. Ivan seems kind of vindicated in his lack of faith in God. Um, and and hence why he says he's going to return his ticket and well-meaning people uh and i say well-meaning because it is it is definitely a well-meaning thing i think it just comes from the, the wrong place in some ways they'll say and perhaps many of us have heard it, everything happens for a reason so in our attempts to try and explain evil to try and explain it we are inclined to say that everything happens that everything that is evil happens because it has some greater purpose. And I think this is just a veiled way of distancing ourselves from suffering in some way. When we're saying, oh, everything happens for a reason, it's a way of not dealing with the problem. Um, and besides, I think that they're, they're, they're hardly uh, comforting words to the person who has suffered horrendous evil. It is better to simply be present in the person's suffering, to be with them, to not necessarily say anything, but to hate that suffering on their behalf. Um, than it is to say, well, everything happens for a reason. Uh, and, and to hate that suffering with, with um, the psalmist talks about having a perfect hatred. And I think that's the kind of perfect hatred we should have is of, is of true horrendous evil and suffering. And this is what David Bentley Hart, again, is getting at in this, in this quote. Um, the evil has no contribution to make. It is obscene to mitigate the scandal of suffering by allowing hope to degenerate into banal confidence in God's great plan. This idea that everything happens for a reason. Such confidence all too easily blinds us to the spiritual universe of the New Testament. Um, these are harsh words, but I think they're true. And Christian hope is not some blind confidence or certainty 
in the supposed purpose of evil and suffering. I think that's just a kind of shallow optimism that prevents us from truly understanding the Bible's witness to the self-revelation of God in Christ, the crucified God. And Fleming writes this, uh, that evil is in no way a part of God's good purpose and cannot be since it does not have existence as a created good. Evil is neither rationally nor morally intelligible and must simply be loathed with a perfect hatred and resisted. The beginning of resistance is not to explain, but to see. Seeing is itself a form of action. Seeing evil for what it is, not a part of God's plan, but a colossal X factor in creation, a monstrous contradiction a prodigious negation that must be identified, denounced and opposed wherever it occurs. So the notion of evil as a kind of cosmic force of negation plays very much into uh, the, the motif of the apocalyptic war as well. Evil has a kind of cosmic scope and it can be distinguished then from just mere wrong. We distinguish it between evil and wrong. Um, Hitler's final solution uh, wasn't just wrong. It wasn't merely wrong. It was evil. And, and I think Lance Morrow touches on this brilliantly, where he says people have systems of laws to right wrongs. But evil implies a different universe, again, very apocalyptic language, controlled by extra human forces. Wrong is a human offence that suggests reparation is possible and deserved. Wrong is not mysterious. Evil suggests a mysterious force that may be in business for itself and may exploit human agency as part of a larger cosmic conflict between good and evil, God and Satan. I think the thing about Nazism and uh, other atrocities like, like that is that they all implicate, uh, they implicate all of us in some way. These are not individual acts carried out by single persons, which we can easily distance ourselves from, like, oh, we're not, I'm not a serial killer, therefore I'm not evil. These are acts of evil carried out by groups, corporations, governments. It is evil that has been systematically organized to be carried out by groups of people. Um, the chief interpreter of the Nuremberg trials, Richard Sonnenfeld, uh, recalled that the, he said that the chief Nazis were just uh, the normal people you might meet on the street. But they were people who had succumbed to the greed of power, which is why he says that people have, have to realize that power and evil run on the same track. In um, 2003, uh, when the Iraq war began, uh, the US government at the same time embarked on a secret program of overseas detention centers, which were known as the, the black sites, uh, where forms of torture were practiced, which is against international law. And Dick Cheney at the time said uh, of this plan, we think that it guarantees that we'll have the kind of treatment of these individuals that we believe they deserve. Uh, they were treated, they were tortured because they deserved torture. When uh, the CIA operatives who had carried out this torture were later interviewed, they reported having nightmares. Uh, and one of them said, when you cross over that line of darkness, it's hard to come back. You lose your soul. When we think of hell, we might think of those perpetrators of sin who deserve it. And this is a universal human tendency um, to separate out people into the goats and the sheep. It's that sin of certainty again, the good people and the bad, the deserving and the undeserving. Uh, John Calvin, the reformer, uh, said that the promise of salvation is willingly and freely offered to us by the Lord in consideration of our misery rather than of our deserving. So the gospel, if we're to believe in the descent into hell and that Jesus goes there to proclaim the gospel, to liberate the captives, to undo death to plunder the strong man's house. The gospel is good news, not just for victims then, for the people who were the victims of evil, but also for the perpetrators too. And this is where it's scandalously good news. Uh, it's, it's very bad news for anyone who thinks that they can divvy, say that you're ungodly and I'm godly. It's dreadfully good news. And this is hard to fathom. Uh, and I think Fleming again touches on it here. If we say that Jesus Christ descended into hell, perhaps we mean most of all the hell of the perpetrators. 
not just those who are in Sheol because they died, not just those who are in limbo awaiting the conqueror, but those who are in Gehenna under a sentence of everlasting condemnation. And the Bible is also clear that while the new Jerusalem's gates will never be shut, hell has no such future. Uh, hell does not have the final word. Death does not have the final word. As Paul says, death shall have no more dominion. The kingdom of death will be destroyed. The, the, the strong man's house is, is going to be obliterated. And I think I'll, I'll finish now because we've, we've gone over already anyway. Um, just with that, that verse from, from 1 Peter again, because uh, I think it's profoundly hopeful um, in that sense and, and puts me in absolute awe and stunned by the grace of God uh, and, and the reach of God's grace and the, the extent of his love the extent of his his judgment, his wrath, and his, his rectifying action, uh, which is an extent of his love. And Peter says, Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey. So um, I think that's a very uh, strangely hopeful note to end on. Um, no one is beyond redemption, not even the worst of the worst. And sometimes we might feel like that. Sometimes we might not, most of the time we might not. But um, I, I, I'll, I'm going to end there. And I'm very sorry that we're, I'm going to say we don't have time for questions or thoughts, but you can email me. Please do email me. Um, uh, any that you have and, and we can we can go at it from there but also thank you so so much for tuning in and we've got two weeks left of Lent um, so I really pray that it is a most blessed Lent for all of you and that we'll all be awed and stunned by the grace of God the scandalous grace of God and the gospel of very very uh, good news uh, over this next uh, couple of weeks uh, as we prepare to celebrate that uh, Jesus didn't stay on the cross, didn't stay in hell, but he rose again and is alive in each of us in our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit. So um, thank you all so much and uh, have a wonderful night's nice rest and I'll see you all again soon.